following is an EWTN special presentation. It is uh, very exciting to be here with all of you at this year's NAPA. Uh, conference that's uh, in the year of Our Lady of Fatima as we're remembering the 100 year anniversary here. And I'm excited to share with you a little bit about the rosary, uh, a little bit practically uh, what difference it makes for our lives. But hearing so many of the presentations today uh, about the cultural challenges we're facing in our world, we know we need help, as we just heard here. And uh, our help needs to come from above. And the rosary is an incredible gift that can help us with that. But I want, I want to think about Our Lady of Fatima the way a great hero of mine, and I think of many of yours, a thought of Our Lady of Fatima, and that's St. John Paul II. He once said that Our Lady of Fatima summed up the entire 20th century, from her foretelling the end of World War I to foretelling the rise of another great war on the horizon if the world did not repent to her foretelling the rise of communism and Russia as a dominant power that would provoke even more wars and more famines and, and greater persecution of the Catholic Church. And indeed, in the 20th century, we saw a, an era of, of so much persecution, more than the previous centuries had put together before. Uh, she also foretold the sufferings that the Church would go through, particularly the popes from Pius X all the way up to John Paul II, and, predict, and particularly foretelling the great assassination attempt on his life. But John Paul II was concerned especially about one central request that Our Lady made. It's the one request that she made in all six of her apparitions. Uh, and does anyone remember what that request was? It was to pray the rosary, and to pray the rosary every once in a while? to pray it daily, to pray it daily. Uh, and, and John Paul II was concerned about that, uh, that the beautiful tradition uh, the, of the rosary, and was concerned that it wasn't being passed on effectively. And I wanna, I wanna tell you a little personal story about how John Paul II's concern about the rosary impacted my life profoundly one day. Uh, way back in 1999, I was invited to uh, speak at a conference for catechists and school teachers in the Diocese of Pittsburgh. A priest from Pittsburgh called me up and he said, could you give a talk on something about Mary uh, at, our, at our catechetical conference? And I said, oh sure, I'd love to speak on Mary. And I said, well, when, was, when is the conference? And he said, oh, it's, it's October 2002. I thought, October 2002, that's three years from now. So I said, oh, excuse me, you mean next year, right? October 2000, right? And he said, no, 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 I mean October 2002. We plan in advance here. <laughs> uh, and so I agreed to do that, but little did I know way back then in 1999 that three years later, 48 hours before I was gonna get on a plane to go to Pittsburgh to give a talk, John Paul II was going to do something to make me have to completely rewrite my talk. <laughs> Does anyone know what he did? Do you remember? And in October of 2002, he gave us those new mysteries of the rosary. He came out with a whole letter on the rosary, and he called for a year of the rosary, a year dedicated to renewing our devotion to Our Lady in the rosary. And I knew everyone was gonna be talking about this, <laughs> and they wanted information, so I had to totally scrap what I was gonna do, get online, get the document, and try to teach on it. But let's think about that for a moment. Why did John Paul II do that? Why did he give us these new mysteries, and why did he call for a year of the rosary? Well, in his letter, he gives three stated reasons. He gives three stated reasons. One is he said that we're facing a crisis of the rosary, a crisis of the rosary. He said the rosary is being devalued today in the Catholic Church. He said it's misunderstood by many of our own Catholics. It's no longer being taught to the younger generation. And I, I can attest to that. I, I remember when I was fresh out of college in my previous career, long before the world of theology, I was working in the corporate world in Michigan, and I remember I, I would stop by my local parish every once in a while and, and after work, and I would pull out my beads and, and, and pray the rosary. And one day I was there in, in the front row, just all by myself in the church, and I had my beads out there and praying, and, and, and the door opened up to the side, and, and a woman walked in, she was probably in her late 50s, 
and she was just standing there at the door, and I just continued to proceed praying my, my rosary, and a few beads go by, and, and have you ever had that feeling someone's watching you? I had that feeling that day, and sure enough, I look over, and, and she's staring at me, and a few more beads go by, and she's still staring at me, and I'm feeling a little uncomfortable. What is she looking at? And finally, she comes, and she walks up to me right in front of my face. She bends down, and she says, excuse me, are you praying the rosary? And I have my beads. I'm like, uh, yes. <laughs> And she said, wow, you must be uneducated. Ooh, ouch. <laughs> I felt a, a, a little insulted. I didn't know what she meant by that. I asked her, well, what do you mean? And she said, uh, well, let me tell you my story. She said, I, I grew up in a home where our family prayed the rosary. Every night after dinner, we prayed the rosary. And I, I, I finished high school. I never went to college, but I went off and lived on my own. And all these years, all my life, I've always prayed the rosary. But I was in a, another parish just last week, kneeling down in the front pew like you are, praying the rosary, and a priest walked in, and he told me I shouldn't pray that prayer anymore. He told me that this prayer is only for the uneducated people, that now after Vatican II, Vatican II has taught us that we don't need the rosary anymore, you know, but that this is only for, for uneducated people. And I thought, you know, well, since I... I, I didn't go to college. I'm not educated. I guess that's why I, I pray the rosary. But you're here, and you're in this business suit. And did you go to college? I said, yeah, I went to college. Said, well, I was surprised to see you praying the rosary. And I felt horrible for this, this, this woman who had been humiliated for praying the rosary. But I felt even worse for this poor, misguided priest who's confused. Maybe it wasn't his fault. Maybe he had bad formation. Who knows what happened there? But, but I share that story because I think John Paul II's right to be concerned about the rosary being passed on. Uh, I do a lot of work with college students from my work with Focus, and I, I, I've talked to them throughout the years. And many of these young adults and college students, it, many of them didn't grow up with the rosary. They don't know much about it. You ask them about the rosary. Rosary, what's that? I don't know what that's about. Oh, wait. Oh, yeah, that's the prayer my grandma used to pray, or the rosary. Oh, that's the funeral home prayer. You know, that, that's many people's impression of the rosary. And so I think John Paul II, with his great devotion to Our Lady of Fatima, toward the end of his life in 2002, he, he wanted to spark a, a renewed interest in the rosary, and that's why he drew attention to it, one reason why, with the new mysteries and the year of the rosary. But there's a second reason, he said. He also said there's not only a crisis of the rosary, there's also a crisis of peace. And he wrote this in the wake of the attacks of September 11, 2001. And in this beautiful letter, he said, only an intervention from on high can give us reason to hope for a brighter future. He saw that the world is, 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 is teetering, perhaps, on another great disaster, another great war. And, and, and he said, the, the one thing we need to do is do what Our Lady of, of Fatima told us to do, to pray the rosary. And it's a beautiful, fitting prayer for peace, where we contemplate Jesus, the Prince of Peace, and Mary, who gave birth to the Prince of Peace in the rosary. There was a third stated reason, he said, so crisis of the rosary, crisis of peace, but he also talked about the crisis of the family, the crisis of the family. He talked about the breakdown in marriage and family life today, many families having difficulty communicating with one another, knowing each other's hearts, looking in each other's eyes, forgiving one another. He talked about the, the ideological movements that are trying to redefine what marriage and family is all about. He says if there's ever a time that we need to pray for the family, it's now. And the rosary is a great prayer to turn to. He noted in the letter how the few times families actually come together anymore. It's when they're gathered around a screen watching some video or watching television. He said, wouldn't it be wonderful if families would fill their daily lives with very different images? Not just what's on YouTube, not just what's on the, the, the television, but the images of Jesus, Mary, and Joseph in the rosary. Now, those were the three stated reasons, the crisis of the rosary, crisis of peace, crisis of the family. But, but there's a fourth reason that he doesn't explicitly come out and say, but I think is probably the most profound one. You see, John Paul II announced these new mysteries in this year of the rosary on a date that was very important to him personally. It was October 16th. Does anyone know why that was important for John Paul II? That was the anniversary of his pontificate. And at the very beginning of his pontificate, he talked about how his life was in the, in the rhythm of the rosary. He talked about how important the rosary was. But then he also gave a very personal testimony. I mean, I, I've, re I've read so many documents of JP2 
But this was the one I thought was perhaps the most personal, the most intimate. It was as if he was opening up his soul to us about how much the rosary has made a difference in his life. I'm going to read you a quote from what he said here. He said, From my youthful years, this prayer has held an important place in my life. The rosary has accompanied me in moments of joy and moments of difficulty. To the rosary, I have entrusted any number of concerns, and in it, I've always found comfort. And then when he talks about facing moments of difficulty and trial and turning to Mary in the rosary, these, these are the words of a man who knew suffering. We know his life, and this is a man who lost his mom when he was in the third grade. He lost his brother who died of tuberculosis, and then at the age of 20, he, he lost his dad. And, and he sat by his dad's bedside and wept for like 18 hours. As, as he, and he wrote later on about how, he, how, how, how lonely he felt. He never felt so lonely before when losing his last immediate family member. This is a man that knew suffering. This is a man who, under the Nazi occupation, was forced into slave-like labor to work in a rock quarry. He was hit by a German truck, and the Gestapo searched his home looking for him. This is a man who worked in the underground resistance. He was in the underground seminary. And then after the Nazis, as, as a young priest and bishop, he had to fight the evils of communism. This is a man that knew difficulties and challenges and suffering. And then as pope, he had the weight of the world on his shoulders for all those years. And toward the end of his pontificate, toward the end of his life, he exhorts us to turn to something that made such a difference at those crucial moments in his life, the rosary. These are not the words of some abstract theologian or out-of-touch pastor who's just exhorting us to cling to our beads for the sake of saving some pious devotion he's afraid is going out of style. No, that's not what's going on here. These are words that flow from a man who experienced many trials and sufferings and found the rosary to be a tremendous source of strength. And like a good spiritual father, toward the end of his life, he wanted to share that treasure with us as if he was giving the church one last gift, turn back to the rosary. Now, we're all hearing how important the rosary was for John Paul II. We're hearing about how Our Lady of Fatima was exhorting us to pray the rosary, and then we hear that she said to pray it every day. And, and, and for some of us, we go, oh, that's good. That's affirming what I've been doing. I've been praying the rosary every day. And then there's other of us here going, Every day? That's hard. I don't know if I can do that. You know, I, I, let's think about that for a moment. I want to go practical here. You know, the rosary is, is not an easy prayer to pray, is it? I mean, on one hand, it's really easy, right? It's, it's, it's like the, the ABCs of Catholic piety. You know, they say, in our Father, ten Hail Marys, and a glory be. It's like the very basics. So on one hand, it's easy. But on the other hand, do you ever find it can be difficult to pray the rosary? Do you ever find it so challenging? You know, I know some people, especially many, many young people, they describe the rosary as very intimidating. They call it, it's like the marathon of all Catholic devotions. Uh, but I, I don't know, you all are really smart and devout Catholics, so this might not relate to you, but I just want to ask, does your mind ever wander when you pray the rosary? Does that, <laughs> does that ever happen? You know what I'm talking about? Like, you, you, you pull out your beads and you're praying, you know, and a few, few beads go by and you're thinking about what you're going to eat that night. You're thinking about some problem at work, or you're thinking about something someone said to you earlier in the day, and you're thinking, what did she mean by that? Oh, wait, I'm supposed to be thinking about the angel Gabriel coming to Mary in the Annunciation, and, and you kind of feel bad about that, right? But your mind wanders a lot. Or do you ever treat the rosary like a spiritual chore? Like it's something like you just, oh, I showed up at this event, and I got to do it, you know? Uh, and and, and, and you, know, you, you show up at something, and all of a sudden you see everybody pulling out their beads, and you go, oh, I hope we only do a decade. And you know, you know I, I know I should like it more. I know it's an important prayer, but I, 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 my heart's not really into this. And you're praying along, and it's like, oh, we're only on the second sorrowful mystery. And, and, and every decade really feels like 10 years. Uh, th this is the real-life experience of many good, holy people in praying the rosary. Or how about this one, right? You have a busy day, and you finally sit down. You're in a church pew or back at home, and you pull out those beads. What happens? You sit down, and what happens? You doze off in the middle of a Hail Mary. You know, I, I've, had, I've been blessed to talk about the rosary with probably hundreds of times in different groups with good devout lay people like yourself, to priests, to bishops, to contemplative nuns, and they all tell me 
how challenging the rosary is for them. Uh, I remember one bishop in the Midwest many years ago, he was in the audience, and I just said, so Archbishop, is, is this hard for you? And he goes, oh, it's really hard. I struggle all the time. So even bishops with apostolic succession struggle with the rosary. I want to offer some encouragement. That is, never walk away from the rosary feeling defeated, feeling discouraged, feeling like that was a waste of time. Never do that. Because the words themselves, just simply saying those words, they're, they're from Scripture. They're biblical. They're holy. We're giving something beautiful to God. And, and it's the great doctor, the St. Saint Thomas Aquinas says, the intention to pray is the foundation of all prayer. Uh, and, and while I might lose my attention sometimes when I'm praying the rosary or I show up at mass or I'm doing my holy hour, my, my mind might wander. If I really come with a sincere intention, I'm sincerely trying to give God my best, and then it doesn't work out so well, God saw my intention. He saw my heart. You know, it reminds me, I remember my, uh, my daughter, my, my, my eldest daughter, when she was a little girl, she was like three years old, she, this is my firstborn, she started drawing pictures. And I would come home from work, and she would go, Daddy, Daddy, here's some pictures. And she'd show me all these pictures that she was making uh, for me. And she wanted to give them to me as a gift. And I'd look at them, and they were just a bunch of scribbles. I couldn't make out what they were. And i go, what is that, honey? And she goes, that's you, Daddy. I'm like, oh. <laughs> and, and, and what would you think of a father that took all those scribbles and ripped up those pages and said to the daughter, don't you ever dare try to draw a picture for me again until you get it exactly right. You know, no good father would do that. As a dad, I didn't care about the final product, you know, that it was a bunch of scribbles. I saw her heart, that she's thinking of me, she's trying to draw a picture for me, she wants to give me a gift. And I think our Heavenly Father looks at us the same way. When we come with a good intention, we desire to give God our best. Now, I gotta be clear, this is not an excuse to check messages in between decades of the rosary or try to work in a few beads you know, in between downs during your favorite football game. That's not what I'm talking about. But if we come with a good intention, don't walk away feeling discouraged because who is it that plants those seeds in your mind saying, you're not good at this prayer? Why bother praying this prayer? You just fall asleep all the time. Your mind always wanders. This is a waste of time. You're too busy to pray this prayer. Who's putting those thoughts in your head? That's not from God, that's from the enemy. And he'll use discouragement to keep us from this beautiful prayer. That being said, I think we all want to get better. We want, we, we want to really encounter Jesus, encounter Mary more, be strengthened more from this prayer. And sometimes it can feel dry, it can feel monotonous, it can feel like a chore. John Paul II, in his letter on the rosary, he, he offered us a lot of practical insight into the meaning of the rosary and practical ways to pray it so that it can be more personal, more meaningful. You know, I, I remember there's a friend of mine, and he, he once said, you know, I was talking to him about the book I was writing on the rosary, and he said, you know, Ted, if you can, you know, make the rosary meaningful and easy for me to pray as just an average Joe like me, I, 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 would, I would really appreciate that. And I think that's where many people are at. They know it's important, they know it's beautiful, but sometimes we don't feel like we're doing it that well. I want to share with you a couple of insights from St. John Paul II on this. And the first two insights I want to look at deal with probably some of the two biggest questions people have about the rosary. What do you think, you know, are the big questions people have about the rosary and why we should pray it, especially maybe our, our Protestant brothers and sisters that aren't Catholic? What, what, what questions might they say about the rosary? Repetition. repetition. Why do you have all of this repetition in the rosary? You just keep repeating the same words over and over again. In fact, you know, I, I've had some Protestant friends of mine, I have dear evangelical friends, they'd say, you know, hey, Ted, you're, you're if, if you Catholics would just read the Bible, you would see Jesus condemned vain repetition. You know, and, and so why do you have all of this repetition? This is a dry, mechanical way of speaking to God. That prayer should come from the heart. It should just be intimate. It should be conversational. Like, think about it. Like, what husband comes home from work and starts pulling out note cards and saying, hi, honey, how are you? Hi, honey, how are you? Hi, honey, how are you? I'm fine. We don't talk that way. We want, when, we, when we want to talk to someone we love, we just talk from our heart. Why do you have all this repetition in the rosary? That's an excellent question. I think it's a very good question that our Protestant brothers and sisters may have, and even some of us Catholics may have. And John Paul II has some great answers. I'll get to that in a moment. But what's the other big question you think uh, are, are, is out there? Yeah, why are you giving so much attention to Mary, right? 
Now, if somebody asks you the question, hey, why do you Catholics worship Mary? I think we as Catholics are getting better at answering that question, right? If someone says to you, why do you worship Mary? What do you say? We don't worship Mary. We honor Mary or we venerate Mary. And we, so we make that distinction between worship and honoring. And that's a good move to make. But I have to be honest with you, with my dear evangelical Protestant friends, they, they say, thank you for that distinction, but I'm still concerned about the rosary because you spend so much time with Mary. I mean, think about what happens in every decade. You've got one Our Father, followed by 10 Hail Marys, and it's concluded by a Glory Be. So what's the score at the end of every decade? One point for God the Father, one point for the Holy Trinity, and 10 points for Mary. That's a little bit of an imbalance, you Catholics. I mean, imagine if there was a husband that on the weekend when he's home, he decides to spend one hour with his wife, one hour with his kids, and 10 hours with some other woman. That's not going to go over well in a, in a marriage. And, and, and yet you Catholics say, well, we're just honoring Mary. We're not, but you're spending so much time with her. Again, I think that these are great, honest, sincere questions. And John Paul II has some great answers. Let's, let's, let's take repetition first. In the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 6, Verses 7 and 8. It's true. Jesus there says, Don't heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do. Do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do. But what we have to see here is Jesus isn't condemning all forms of repetition in prayer. He's criticizing the particular practice of the Gentiles, the pagans. They had a practice of, of repeating certain formulas or certain names of their, of their gods in order to try to control their god, to manipulate their god. They get their god to come down and work for them or make their, their crops flourish or, or defeat their enemies. So they're trying to get God to come down and do something for them. And Jesus says, don't heap up phrase, those empty phrases like the Gentiles do. Don't treat your heavenly father that way. Trust that your heavenly father has a plan for you. And it's for your good and your welfare. Trust his plan is better than what, what anything you could come up with. Don't try to make God come down and work for you. Try to have your will be entrusted to his and his plan for you. That's what Jesus is going after. We know that he's not condemning repetition itself because Jesus himself repeats his prayers. Do you remember the night before he died, he, go, he, he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane, Matthew 26, verse 44. What does the Bible tell us? Remember how he, he's on his knees and he's sweating and, and he's saying, you know, not your will, but my will be done. Remember, remember that in the garden? And, and the Bible tells us in Matthew 26, 44, Jesus repeated that prayer three times. He, he, he used repetition. We know he's not condemning repetition itself because right after in the Sermon on the Mount when he says, don't heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, he says, when you pray, instead pray like this. And what does he do? He gives us a formula prayer to pray. The Lord's Prayer, pray like this, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, a prayer he wants us to repeat. The Bible is very comfortable with repetition. We see this all over the place. Take, for example, in Daniel chapter 3, if you remember that story about the three men that were thrown in the fiery furnace, those good Jewish men, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they're, they're thrown in the fiery fur furnace by the wicked king, and, but they trust their lives to God, and they praise God, and they continue to say, sing praise to him, and may, may he be highly exalted forever. Sing praise to him, and may he be highly exalted forever. They repeat that prayer over 30 times. And God is not in heaven saying, oh, don't do all that repetition. No, God comes down and rescues them. The same thing in the New Testament, in the book of Revelation, chapter 4, verse 8. St. John has a vision of the four living creatures bowing down before God and never ceasing to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. So repetition is biblical. It's a part of the heavenly liturgy. Now, trying to manipulate God through vain repetition like the pagans did to get God to come down and just do what you want. That, that, that's what Jesus was condemning. But prayerful repetition is biblical and pleasing to God. Another thing I think we could see and we think about that other question is are we giving too much attention to Mary here? Uh, I, I want to just share something that really I impacted me when I was reading this document from St. John Paul II. I think this is one of the most beautiful Nuggets about Mary I, I read in this document from, from, from JP2. And so if you don't remember anything else of this talk, but you give me your best attention right now for like the next five, seven minutes, so a little intellectual caffeine shot right here. If you could do that, you, I think you'll come away with something 
beautiful from St. John Paul II because it changed the way I thought about the Hail Mary. And I was a theologian at the time when I read this. You know, before, if someone asked me, hey, tell me about the Hail Mary. Why, do you, why does it focus on Mary so much? I would have said, well, we don't worship Mary. We, we honor her. Yeah, I would have made that move. And I would have said, and we're not praying to Mary like we pray to the Holy Trinity. We're asking Mary to intercede for us like I may ask you to pray for me or we ask our friends to pray for each other. I would have, I would have done that, those kinds of moves. But John Paul II, I'm sure he would have agreed with those points, but, but he did something even more profound. He said this. He said, the Hail Mary is a Christ-centered prayer. The Hail Mary is a Christ-centered prayer. It's a prayer that's all about Jesus. And, and, and when he went on and to expound on this, the insights he had completely revolutionized the way I thought about and, and to this day pray the Hail Mary and pray the rosary. So, so give me your best instructions. What, what I want you to do is, go, uh, is enter into what John Paul II is telling us about the Hail Mary. And he, he focuses on the two different halves of the Hail Mary. In the first half, he talks about those opening words, Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with thee, and blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. So let's take the, the first half here. So, Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Who spoke those words? Gabriel. Gabriel spoke those words. Let's think about what those words would have meant for Gabriel, the archangel. So imagine you're Gabriel, the archangel, and, and you, you've existed longer than Mary, right? You've been around long before she has. You've existed longer than Nazareth or the nation of Israel. You've existed before planet Earth or even the physical universe was created. So when God first created, he created the invisible beings, the spiritual beings, the angels. And so Gabriel, from very early on, is able to, to, to see and to love and to worship the Almighty God. Now, to think about this, so here's Gabriel who loves, adores, worships the Almighty, all-powerful, all-holy, infinite God. And one day, this God instructs Gabriel to go down to this little, little, tiny planet called Earth and go to this little, little, tiny, obscure village named Nazareth to talk to this little tiny creature, this woman named Mary, and announce to her that the almighty, all-powerful, infinite Son of God that he's been worshiping and loving and adoring is about to become a baby in her womb? Whoa. In awe over that mystery of God becoming a baby in Mary's womb, the angel Gabriel says, Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with you. The Lord is with you like he's never been with anyone else. Gabriel is in awe over the mystery of Christ, the mystery of the incarnation. That's what we enter into every time we pray the Hail Mary. But then let's think about the next words. The next words come from Luke 142, the next scene, the visitation, right? Who spoke those words? Elizabeth, Mary's cousin. Elizabeth says, blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. Now, what's interesting, when you read the story, we see that uh, uh, Mary comes to, to greet Elizabeth, and, 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 and Elizabeth comes rushing out and then says these words. How does Elizabeth know that Mary's pregnant? How does Elizabeth know that Mary's pregnant with the Lord? How does she know all this? Did Mary send a text message on her way down? Did she change her status on Facebook? How, 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 did, how did Elizabeth know? Do you know what the Bible says? The Bible tells us that Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Filled with the Holy Spirit. That's like biblical code for she's being given the gift of prophecy. Many great heroes of the Old Testament like David and uh, Samuel and others and the prophets, when they're filled with the Holy Spirit, they're able to utter prophecy. And so she's given supernatural insight here, and she knows before Mary says anything. She knows that Mary's pregnant, that she's pregnant with the Lord, and that's why she says, blessed are you among all women. There's never been anyone blessed like you, for blessed is the fruit of your womb. So Elizabeth, like Gabriel, is in awe over the mystery of God becoming man in Mary. And here's what John Paul II said. Every time we pray the Hail Mary, we enter into the wonder of heaven and earth 
over the mystery of Jesus. We enter into the wonder of heaven represented by Gabriel and earth represented by Elizabeth. We participate in their ecstatic praise of the mystery of Jesus Christ, praising God for becoming man in her womb. Is that pretty Christ-centered? Absolutely. This is all about Jesus. So this is this has changed the way I think about the ro the rosary. I think about the Hail Mary. That sometimes I don't do this all the time, but every once in a while I start I pray the Hail Mary and I just think about Gabriel and his awe over this mystery. I may think about Elizabeth and her awe over the mystery of Christ. So we're we're entering their praise, their awe, and their wonder over Jesus. And then in the second half, we say, Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. And and here. We're also asking Mary to intercede for us. We're asking her to pray for us. She who was the first one to say yes to God in the new covenant era with her fiat at the Annunciation. She who said yes all throughout her life from the nativity to the presentation to Cana all the way to the cross and even after Jesus ascends in heaven, she's still there praying with the disciples at Pentecost. And Book of Revelation describes her as a, having a crown of glory in heaven the crown that all the saints wear. So we ask her, who said yes from the beginning to the end of her life, totally saying yes to God, we ask her to pray for us that we might say yes as well to Jesus, to follow his will in our lives, now and all the way up to the hour of our death. But then St. John Paul II gives particular attention to the middle, the middle of the Hail Mary, the very center he calls it the center of gravity. He also calls it the hinge of the Hail Mary. You know what that is? What's the center? The name of Jesus. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. John Paul II called this the center of gravity, the hinge of the Hail Mary. And he said that when we, particularly when we pray the rosary, he said emphasis should be placed on Christ's name. He was worried that sometimes we give a too hurried recitation of the rosary. We go too quickly, uh, and, and we don't focus on the very holy name of Jesus. This is the name that the Bible says whenever two or three are gathered in Jesus' name, he's there in our midst. This is the, at the name of Jesus, St. Paul says, every knee shall bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth. This is a powerful name. There's power in this name, and G John Paul II wants us to give it due reverence. You know, I, I, I once... I once attended the fastest rosary on earth. I, I, I really think it was, I, the Guinness Book World Records recorded these things, I'm sure this would be in it, because it was like an under nine minute rosary, sub nine rosary here. <laughs> uh, and and, and they, they sounded like auctioneers when they prayed the rosary. I was like, hail Mary, full of grace, Lord is with you, blessed are the only but sold. I mean, it was like that fast. I'm, I'm not exaggerating. And God blessed them for praying the rosary before mass every day, when, in a period when many people were throwing away their beads. I'm sure God delighted that they had the good intention. But I think John Paul II would invite them and all of us to maybe just slow down a little bit, at least at the name of Jesus. We don't have to pray the rosary really slow, but at least at the name of Jesus, speak the name with love. You know, a friend of mine says you should treat the name of Jesus in the Hail Mary like a speed bump. <laughs> like a speed bump. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Uh, to speak it with love. You know, uh, John Paul II even suggested, and we don't have to do this, he just offered this as one way that he's done the rosary a number of times, uh, and it's a, it's, a, it's a tradition in some European countries to add a clause after the name of Jesus in every Hail Mary for those 10 Hail Marys of the decade that relate those 10 Hail Marys to the one mystery that you're contemplating. So for example, if you're doing the first sorrowful mystery, you could say, blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus agonizing in the garden, Jesus agonizing in the garden, or Jesus sweating like drops of blood, or Jesus doing the Father's will. Something that brings your mind's attention back to the mystery. And if you're someone like me that's very spiritually ADHD and your mind's going all over here, you know, I, you could, you, this can be really helpful. I find like if I'm driving the car and I'm praying the rosary, sometimes I'll pray it this way because that can bring me right back. Okay, I'm supposed to be thinking about the, the, the agony in the garden right now. Or if you're doing, you know, the fifth glorious mystery, you can say, blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus crowning his mother, Mary. Or, or the first glorious mystery, Jesus rising from the dead, or Jesus being touched by Thomas, or, or Jesus with Mary, Matt. You can just picture one of those scenes, uh, and it can help you to, to come back to it. So, in summary here, I think John Paul II wants us to view 
the repetition of all these Hail Marys in the rosary is not some dry, mechanical, superficial exercise. But he wants us, he says, he, he said, he wants us to see the repetition of the Hail Mary in, quote, the dynamic of love. The dynamic of love. I love that, that, that imagery here. The, uh, the, the repetition of the Hail Mary should be seen in the context of a relationship of love. Now, my wife and I, just last week, we celebrated our, our uh, 18th wedding anniversary. And it was really great. I, I tell you, I, I took, uh, thank you. I took my wife out for a very special date night. It was, it was wonderful. We were driving across the country, a one-day trip from Denver, Colorado, all the way to Chicago. And somewhere in the middle of Iowa, we pulled over, and I took her to a Cadoba with all of our eight kids jumping up and down in hysterics, and, and, I, and I let her get extra guacamole. It was really special. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, even though we didn't get to celebrate the full date, that'll come next week, but uh, you know, that night I told her, I love you. A and I've told my wife many times in our marriage, hundreds, thousands of times, I love you. Sometimes I can be on a date night, look her in the eye and say, I love you. Sometimes I'm just running out the door, going to work, honey, love you. Or I can whisper those words right before I fall asleep at night, I love you. Beth has heard those words thousands of times. I gotta tell you, never once has she said, you know, I really can't stand all this vain repetition. <laughs> yeah. Can you come up with something more original here? I mean, you just keep saying the same thing, I love you. I love, no, no, because repetition is part of the language of love in an intimate personal relationship, two person may repeat certain terms of endearment, expressions of love with heartfelt affection. It's the same thing every time. But repetition is part of the language of love. And do we as Catholics, do we have an intimate personal relationship with Jesus Christ? Amen, yes we do, of course. And I think that's the context for understanding the repetition of the Hail Mary. So in the rosary, what we're doing is we're repeating the words of the Hail Mary, which are centered on Jesus himself. Repeating them over and over again. We're participating in that all-filled wonder of heaven and earth, of Gabriel and Elizabeth over the mystery of Christ. And bead after bead, we're asking Our Lady to intercede for us, to help us to, to say yes and to do the Father's will in our lives like she did. And, and prayer after prayer, we're affectionately repeating the name of our beloved, our beloved Savior that's at the center of every Hail Mary. We say, blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. So, so that the holy name of Jesus spoken with tender love really becomes the heartbeat of the rosary, the very heartbeat of the rosary. And so th I think these are just profound, beautiful, practical suggestions from St. John Paul II to help us in our praying of the rosary. But I want to conclude with a few other little practical points here. Because while there may be many avid devotees of the rosary, and this is already a part of their daily life, there's others who maybe used to pray it, and they're not praying it as much anymore. And there may be some people here saying, you know, I've not really tried that prayer that much. Wherever we are, you know, John Paul II and uh, and the great saints are inviting us to bring this a little more into our lives. And I want to give just a few practical thoughts on how we could jumpstart a praying of the rosary. First big point, very simple, is know that you don't have to pray it all at once. It, it, it's, that's the ideal way to pray it. Sit down in a quiet place, and you're praying it very reflectively. But if you're saying, you know, I just, I, I just want, I got to get into it, it's okay, just divide it up. Maybe just start by doing one decade a day. That's 2.5 minutes of your life that you can just start praying this prayer, just one decade. But you know, divide it up, do a decade or two in the morning on the way to work, do one decade you know, right before you eat your lunch, do uh, another decade when you go home, on your way home, and another decade right before you go to bed, that's fine. Do it in between meetings, in between emails, whenever you want to do it. You, you don't have to do it all at once. That might be one way to make it easier. You know, there are many holy people, I want to tell you one of them, there was a fellow named, I don't know if you know, heard of him, his name's Joseph Rotzinger. <laughs> Joseph Rossinger said it was too hard for him to do a whole set of the mysteries at once. And so sometimes he says, I, I just do a couple decades at a time. That's okay. If it's okay for Cardinal Rotzinger, I think it's okay for us. Uh, another thing is, the great thing about the rosary is you can pray it anywhere. You can pray it anywhere. I, I think of the rosary as like a portable chapel you can kind of keep in your pocket. A anytime you have like a certain need, you can just pull it out. 
You know, you've got a big problem at work. Okay, I'm going to just pause for a moment and, and pray. Or you get a call from your wife and something's wrong with one of your kids and you can just pause right there and I'm just going to pray uh, one decade right there. Um, you, could, uh, you can pray it while you're going for a walk. You can pray it on the exercise machine. You can pray it in your car. You can pray it when you're doing dishes. It, it, it's, it's, it's just with you all the time. It's a wonderful thing that you can do. And, and another thing, too, is not to be so intimidated about it. That sometimes we as Catholics go, well, what am I supposed to do? I'm supposed to contemplate the mysteries of the rosary, and I get distracted. This is hard. There's so many different ways to pray it. So you can pray it and focus on the mysteries of the rosary. You can think about the wedding of Cana. Think about Jesus dying on the cross. Whatever mysteries we're, we're, we're contemplating that particular day. That's one way to do it. But sometimes you can just focus on the words themselves. Just focus on the words, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Think about Gabriel. Just focus. Sometimes it's just the name of Jesus. I find that the rosary, you know, we heard Archbishop Chaput talk about the need for greater silence, for quiet in our lives. And the rosary can slow us down and bring us into that rhythm of Christ through the rosary. Beautiful prayer, even just to say, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. That's a wonderful gift we can give to God. So I pray that uh, in this year of Fatima, this, this year may inspire us to uh, pray the rosary better, if we've been praying it already, to rekindle our devotion to the rosary, or try it on for size this year, at least with one decade, just for beginners. So thank you so much for having us. This is a delight to be here. I want to mention, oh, I, I mentioned, I, I'll be at the Augustine's new table, which is right out here. Uh, and they wanted me to mention that they have a number of free CDs from Lighthouse Talks that are there, from talks from people like Dr. Tim Gray or uh, Father Spitzer. Uh, and the talk that I, I've given on the rosary, they have actually as a CD there as well. So thank you so much, and God bless you all.